Welcome to Collab Chats. I'm your host, Kira Baker. Today, I'm talking with Miranda Spencer about voting rights and access among people with psychiatric diagnoses. Miranda is a staff editor at Madden America, the webzine of science, psychiatry, and social justice. In this role, she edits two sections, parent resources and personal stories, and writes occasional articles, including media watch reports and other features. As a person with lived experience in the mental health system, she is committed to ensuring everyone seeking support has access to complete information and empowering choices. A graduate of Bard College and NYU and a resident of Philadelphia from 2000 to 2012, she now works from home in rural New Hampshire. Miranda, thank you so much for being here. Uh, It's great to be here. You've recently written a piece for Madden America, which focuses on voting rights and barriers to voting among people with psychiatric diagnoses. Can you talk about how your article came together and what your research process was like? Wow. Um, yeah, it was a really long process. The, the idea came from someone who is an, a, a reader and occasional writer for Mar- Madden America. And she said, you know, I've always been concerned how hard it was to get an opportunity to vote whenever I was an inpatient, a psychiatric inpatient. It always bothered me that it just wasn't sort of even thought of as something that we would be helped with. And um, you guys should write about that. And she actually sent me an article that I go that I uh, summarized quite a bit in the piece I've written um, by two doctors, um, two Harvard psychiatrists in training at the time, who kind of looked around them and said, you know, the election's coming up and I don't see how the people here are going to going to be voting. And they started to do research on like, what are the voting rights? Can they vote? Even though they, you know, some of these people are, are uh, involuntarily committed or, or they're going through mental health crises and, and such, and people in the hospital in general with any, you know, medical diagnosis, you know, what's the story there? And it led them to write an academic journal article about all the research they've done on the, all of the rights that do protect the right to do that and also protect, um, also clarify that institutions, the government, hospitals, are supposed to help people vote through um, various laws like the um, the Voting Rights Act, the America's, Americans with Disabilities Act, and so forth. And so they managed to help people vote. And um, but and people apparently did take an interest in this, and it it was a successful effort. This took place in 2016, but. It turns out that um, there are a lot of laws on the books that still say that people who have a mental illness diagnosis or in some way considered um, mentally deficient or incompetent in some way are not allowed to vote. You have to be, someone has to adjudicate that, a judge has to say that in most cases. But these are laws that have been on the books for hundreds of years sometimes that were started back in the olden days when there were a lot of myths and misconceptions about people with any kind of mental difference or disability. And a lot of them are still on the books and uh, they, you know, they still exist and they still act as impediments to people with mental health diagnoses voting. And especially uh, it isn't even so much the laws, which do, um, have an impact, but the fact that so many service providers and even people themselves don't realize that they are allowed to vote. It's everyone's right. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy over it that about what what constitutes the ability to vote. You know, do you have to know about a lot about politics? Do you have to have a good reason to vote for your candidate? You know, does, does it, it's kind of you know, the othering of of people with mental health issues, you know, of not being able to participate within society. Right. Um, I recently read an article published in the Psychiatric Journal of Rehabilitation, uh, as published in 2019 by Caymans, Blum, and Styron. It Mm -hmm. was called uh, Voting Rights for Persons with Serious Mental Illnesses in the U.S. Um, I'd like to read some information on voting rights by state covered in the article, if that's all right. Yeah. So, I use that as one of my sources, by the way, and I talked to one of the authors. So, yeah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, so, 
I'll just go go through this list. Uh, in 22 states and Washington, D.C., voting isn't allowed if a court determines that a person lacks capacity to vote. Seven states use discriminatory language such as idiots, unsound mind, and insane persons to restrict voting. 13 states prohibit voting by persons under legal guardianship. In the constitution of the state of Vermont um, uh, prohibits people from voting who don't display, quote, quiet and peaceful behaviors. Uh, and according to the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, only 10 states don't have legal restrictions on voting by people with disabilities. What are your thoughts after doing all of the work you've done on navigating this system, given such variation in voting rights by state? Well, that one of my thoughts is it's so all over the place. And apparently um, there is a wonderful organization called the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law in Washington, D.C., and they every couple of years um, update a report on the state by state laws. And so I first looked at their 2016 and then their tw most recent 2018 um, edition. And I was just really stunned at not only how these laws still exist and vary so much, but how there's there can be contradictory. Like the, it'll say one thing, but then there will have been some lawsuit that clarified it, but the first thing's still on the books. And then there's like different rules a little bit for people under guardianship or people with um, developmental disabilities. It's just like a goulash, in my opinion. And, you know, I talked to uh, one of the attorneys at Bazelon and, and she just said the enforcement is all over the map and that they've taken cases for people who were trying to get the right to vote back. And sometimes they won and sometimes they lost. And it was for a variety of reasons. And this is sort of an ongoing thing. And you're in Pennsylvania, which is considered one of the good states, doesn't have any rules against um, but apparently it has still happened because people assume, like, well, one of the things that I really learned from looking at these laws and from talking to people is that being under guardianship, which can sometimes happen if, you know, let's say you're in a severe accident and you need somebody to help you with your activities of daily living, or you have some kind of disability, but just because you have these various things that you don't do the way that so-called able-bodied people do them, does it mean that you lack the capacity to decide on a candidate, that you don't have an opinion? Um, and apparently uh, there's a number of laws that restrict people under guardianship uh, under certain circumstances from voting. But I was told by a lawyer who uh, does this issue full time in California that it's just sort of a matter of course, that if you go under guardianship, they sort of automatically oftentimes will take away your voting rights on the assumption, well, if you can't, if you can't cook for yourself, if you can't make your own financial decisions, then I guess you can't vote either. And so people, you know, sometimes have to go back and kind of fight for their voting rights. Um, there's now fortunately five states that um, I believe that all you have to do if you have had your voting, voting rights taken, um, or even if you haven't, to make sure that you have them, if you are under guardianship, is just go, go to a court or write a letter to a court and just say, I want to vote. You don't have to say, I'm competent. I want to vote for this guy or that gal. You just have to say, I want to vote. And that is now the criterion. If you can express the desire, it, it implies that you is and and you want to exercise it. So, you know, long long story short, in my opinion, it seems pretty much of a mess and and unpredictable. And I think that's one of the major harms. I mean, people with mental health issues vote all the time and often are not stopped because you can't tell by looking at someone, even if you wanted to. Um, but apparently they also are are having obstacles. And it's just gone on forever. The examples that I use in my article, people are telling me about things that happened to them in 2000 or 2008 or, you know, and, you know, or just up to a couple of years ago. And, and who knows what will happen now, um, especially with all the tightening of the voting laws for everybody. So. Right. Yeah. Um, and just sort of considering past elections, um, 
uh, Mark Salzer, who's the director of the Temple University Collaborative, um, was uh, interviewed for a 2012 article uh, from The Atlantic, and he said that Ooh. voting rights for people with mental health disabilities haven't been at the forefront of recent widespread debate because people tend to think the laws are correct. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, the... <laughs> There's, I think, a paternalistic attitude or just a cultural attitude that if you're quote unquote crazy, then why then your vote is gonna gum up the works and somehow make the system that, that it won't be valid. Um, but that, you know, it, it so varies by person. And I think um you know, there, I, as I say, I edit personal stories for Mad in America, and I work with people with some pretty serious diagnoses. And, you know, sometimes they're struggling and other times they're doing better. But, you know, very rarely could you not say, you know, who are you, who are you supporting for president? I mean, there are people, the random person on the street, if you say, why are you voting for this person? They could give a stupid answer. So, you know, it, it just can't make these huge generalizations. But I think it's just the ongoing fear and, and misunderstanding. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of people who would like to say that a lot of different types of people shouldn't be allowed to vote for, you know, they're the wrong party or, um, I don't know, but yeah. I, I think the, um, the idea is the ostensible idea is to protect the uh, integrity of the election. Um, and just sort of this, unfortunately, as I say, as a person with experience in the mental health system, some professionals will kind of tell you like, look, you're sick now and you should lower your expectations for your quality of life and, you know, just focus on managing it and rather than participating in as much as you possibly can, which, you know, some of the people I interviewed said, and also um, scientific articles back this up, that participating in, you know, the social and political sphere is really good for your mental health because it makes you feel part of the community. Right. Um, civic engagement um, and political engagement are such an important domain of community participation. Um, do you, do you think that like it, from the work you did in your, in your article and people you talked with, do you think that assumptions are starting to change yet among the general population? Well, I would have no way of knowing that. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think that would be a good question for someone to do research on, you know, I mean, I don't know if there's ever been a survey, like, do you think people who've been diagnosed with X, Y, or Z should be able to vote or not? I mean, there was an article I read about, um, somebody that tr there were some people who were committed to a psych they were ruled um, not guilty by reason of insanity. And they had been voting for years. They were both very um, interested in politics. And this is in Rhode Island in, I can't recall the year. Um, I think it was in this century though, <laughs> um, or possibly in the 1990s. But someone like called up the board of elections and said, do you know these guys are voting? You know, these they're quote unquote crazy. And you know, we don't, they don't deserve to vote, you know, they're just going to um, compromise the election. And and so it, it came up to a lawsuit that was um, defended by a disability rights group and the people won, basically, they were able to continue to vote. I mean, they were able to say, not reason, not guilty by reason of insanity is not the same as not competent to vote, adjudicated incompetent. Um, and someone has to take the trouble to do that. But that happens mostly with guardianships. But um, nevertheless, the, the fact that it's on the books. Um, any, anyway, in the story in Rhode Island, the person said something really horrible. Like, you know, they, it just said, like, these guys are nuts. That's not a disability and they shouldn't be able to vote. So when so so you talked with a lot of people for this article. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I read a lot of art. Read a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Reviewed. Reviewed lots of stuff. Talked with people. Did you? Would you say that um, you talked with sort of a, a, an equal uh, amount of professionals or uh, mental health professionals and also folks with lived experience? 
I tried to do that as much as possible. I, I put out a call in a lot of different places to talk to people who had been barred from voting. Um, and not a lot of people came forward. Um, but I did, I do quote in the story a number of people and how, what their voting experience was like. Uh, people with lived experience. I did talk to quite a few professionals. And I also talked to any number of, of people in the disability rights community who kind of um, are overlapping in that area because they're usually people with disabilities who are working as professionals in that in that field. Yeah. So um, I, I try to find that balance as much as possible. And, you know, it's always the thing of who will talk to you. But yeah, who's willing to share their story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, the, the stories I have are, are really um, something. And it's mostly that, you know, people who are hospitalized, the people working at the hospital just didn't think it was important for them to vote. Um, so one thing I learned about was the Hatch Act of yes. 1939. Um, and I, I was not aware of this act before. And, and apparently uh, this act was has been misunderstood by mental health professionals. Um, because it says, it says, I, I can't quite, I, I'm just going off my memory, but um, something like you, sh- you, you, professionals should not support uh, consumers to make political choices or something. It's, it's, it's very easily to be misconstrued. Yes. Because, yeah. yeah that actually, one of the people I talked to pointed that out specifically that people often misinterpret the Hatch Act as meaning not only can you not try to influence um someone's vote, which is another concern that people raise. Well, you know, if we um, allow people who are so-called mentally um, incompetent to vote, then the people that assist them, because they're allowed assistance through American Disability Act and other acts, that these people are going to try to put their own opinions on the people voting. They're going to be vulnerable to manipulation. Um, and I think the, the people who cite the Hatch Act um, are afraid they're going to get in trouble for helping them to vote, which actually is required to my understanding of the law, um, because they they're afraid someone will come after them for influencing their vote or or you know having too much of political pressure on them or something like that. Um, and and I think it's. Um, pardon the expression, a cover your ass thing where, well, oh, I think a lot of people probably use HIPAA also and say, like, well, you know, I can't do this because where they're going to get us on HIPAA law or something like that. They just don't know a lot about it. I mean, elections aren't all the time. I think if we had an election every week, I would imagine that hospitals and such would um, be more aware of their responsibility and the general sense of the law. Yeah. Um, so you you've 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 spoken a bit about um barriers to voting for folks who are in an inpatient facility possibly mm-hmm. can you speak about common barriers to voting um for people living in the community um i think well i don't know that these lo- these old laws on the books um you know, it, it kind of has to be enforced. You would have to go out of your way to try to prevent a person. But, but I get the sense that, you know, like, for example, suppose you are regularly seeing a psychiatrist or something and they might not know or they might they might not know how to help you. They might discourage you or just say it's not important. You should focus on other things. Or I think I get the sense that a lot of people don't know that they can. And if they tend to be marginalized people anyway, and and these laws apparently you know impact people of color more harshly, it's like if you if you're dealing with mental health issues and then other issues of being a marginalized population, it's hard to find out what your rights are. It's hard to say like, well, you know, how do I register to vote? Where do I vote? And it's harder and harder now with all the barriers that are trying to be put up for everyone. So I think people in the community, just living in the community you know, they have a lot of challenges already and it, it may and, and might not know that they can. Um, right. Yeah. And there might be barriers with um, getting to the polls, finding yeah, transportation, a voter ID. Yeah. You know, and just um, getting assistance if need be. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking, um, what if, if you are going through a period where you feel agoraphobic and you don't want to leave the house, you know, if, if someone kind of real, you know, knew that maybe they could help you get like an absentee ballot or arrange to go with you or, you know, or so, some kind of thing. Um, 
just to, you know, get assistance that you're legally entitled to. Right. And, and also, um, one th- important point is a lot of people don't necessarily identify as mentally ill. Like I don't, um, even if they have diagnoses in their past or present. And so, but the point is the laws are still there to, to assist you, you know, even if you don't, I, you have it as part of your identity. So you, you've touched on this a bit, but I wanted to ask you, um, what, what is your perspective on the changes that have been made in response to COVID-19, uh, such as voting by mail? Do you think in any way they've served to decrease barriers or is it pretty much just increasing barriers? That remains to be seen whether those votes get counted, but I, I was very relieved by that. I mean, I was able, New Hampshire, where I live, um, which by the way, is one of the states that doesn't have legal you know, laws that... Um, bar people or, or whatever, it's, it's one of the better ones. They also did this thing, um, where you can use fear of COVID-19 as your, um, as your reason for using like a a mail-in ballot. And that is just like a universal thing that you can use. So in a funny way, that's kind of, um, using that kind of, um, for example, if you were ill or something like that, that, same kind of thing that could help people with disabilities could also help everyone now because we're more all impacted by it. So I think that probably if people know about it could really help. And, you know, I'm one of the things I put in the story is that there are good changes going on. I mean, um, some hospitals actually are making much more of an effort to help people to vote. There's a hospital in Massachusetts that has some kind of a voter registration in their ER now or something, which is oh, terrific. Okay. Um, and there's a doctor in Rhode Island who started something called, what is it called? I, I wish I could remember it, but it, it's a web, a kind of a one-stop shop website where people who are hospitalized really, no matter for what it, ailment, um, very close to the election who didn't have time to apply for an absentee ballot can use something called an emergency ballot, which not many people know exists, but most states have them. And so I think there are more things being developed to just help everyone vote. Like one of the, one of the real takeaways that I took after doing my research is you can't even extricate mental health issues from other disabilities particularly in like the mental and cognitive and behavioral, because by law, they tend to be lumped together. And people in that category are lumped together by for statistical reasons. And so you can't tease it out. So it's like, if you're concerned about voting barriers to people with mental health issues, you're really concerned about voting barriers for people with any kind of disability. Um, Because so many, there's so much overlap between the barriers and the laws that help you. Yeah. I'm in New Jersey, actually. I live just across the bridge from Philadelphia. Uh, uh And every New Jersey resident was sent a vote by mail ballot. Um, So I was able to cast my ballot a week ago. Right. It was was such a relief. Um, But I don't know how many states are are offering that. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're um, about to wrap up. Um, I would like to ask you one last question, which is, um, we've got this very big, very big election coming up. Um, what practical advice would you give to someone who is facing barriers to voting? You can go to, to find out what your rights are and such. And I think, you know, if you, if you call your, go to the website of your state election office or go to, um, even just your town hall, um, and, and just ask for, or call or ask or, um, or go on the website and just learn what the status is because it definitely might not be too late. For some states, um, for registration and such, it may be, but you know, there's, there's so many different options. Um, and so you just have to like start with your town hall or your election board or your, um, the, just the government website of your state and, and, and look what it is in your state. Um, but, but basically don't think that because you have mental health issues that you're not allowed to vote. Um, and even if the law says so, these laws are very antiquated and more than likely not legal because they contradict federal law. Right. Miranda Spencer, thank you so much. Thank you. 
Collab Chats is a knowledge translation activity developed by the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Community Living and Participation for Individuals with Serious Mental Illnesses. Funding for this podcast and support for the collaborative comes from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. The contents of this podcast do not necessarily represent the policies of Nidler, ACL, HHS, and you should not assume endorsement by the U.S. federal government. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to discuss it with us, email us at tucollab at temple.edu. To learn more about the work that we do, visit our website at tucollaborative.org or find us on Facebook at Temple University Collaborative on Community Inclusion and on Instagram and Twitter at tucollab.